Good evening, all, and, and thank you for joining us for our second Women in Defence and Security Network uh, careers panel. We're delighted to be able to bring you another careers panel, uh, especially as, as COVID kind of keeps our events online. Um, we also understand that you're all extremely busy, and for some of our audience, this is a particularly busy time slot. So we are taking that into consideration for future events. But as always, we'd love to hear your feedback and also your ideas and any content that you'd like to see from us. Um, I'm Olivia Nelson. I'm the event Assistant Manager of Events and Communications here at ASPE, and I'll be moderating tonight's panel event. Uh, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal people, the tr traditional custodians of the land from where I host this webinar. Uh, to, firstly, to tell you a little bit about ASPE's Women in Defence and Security Network. It's a forum at ASPE established to support the career development of women in the defence and security fields and to establish a network within that. Um, we're delighted to bring you this panel to discuss career pathways in that field um, and how our panelists decided where to next throughout their careers and also how they would answer that question during the current period of uncertainty. Um, I'm joined by four incredible women with some very different backgrounds and kind of career pathways. So I do want to get right into the discussion. Um, I'll start tonight by asking each of the speakers to tell us a little bit about their career backgrounds um, and some of the choices they made throughout their careers. Um, just a quick note for any of our viewers who haven't joined us on the LiveStorm platform before, um, to your right you have a questions tab, um, please feel free to enter any questions you have during the discuss discussion and also there's an upvote function so if, if there is a question that you know you would like to see answered please upvote it and I will try and pass as many of these to our, to our panellists throughout the discussion. So turning to the panel, Jill I might start with you if that's okay. Um, you have extensive experience in business and people strategy, including 25 years in executive service, service roles in APS, working in the areas of national security, border protection and defence, um, before joining ASPE as Deputy Director of the Professional Development Program. Can you tell us a little bit about your career and career path and how you ended up at ASPE and how much, how much of your career was planned, if any, um, <laughs> and how did you know what the next step was? Thanks. Thank, thanks, Olivia, and thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Look, I think for me, um, the thing that describes my uh, career best is diversity. Uh, it was definitely not something that I was thinking about when I first started out uh, to go into national security. I, I actually tra trained as a botanist and I worked as a research botanist for a few years and I went into the Department of Environment and um, I had an opportunity to work on environmental policy um, and connected it with uh, technology and things like geographic information systems and pollutant inventories. And so um, change, um, technology and capability became early focus for me in my career. Um, I managed a big project in defence. We won't talk about which one it is. It sends people into um, lot, lot, lots of personal stories about how scarred they are, so I won't mention the name. Um, and then I went on to uh, work in border security. And again, technology was quite a, a key theme around leading technology-driven change through things like SmartGate and enhanced passenger assessment um, uh, around border protection and so on. Um, so it, it, it's been an interesting journey. Um, I, I guess the themes for me have always been around capability. Uh, I went into consulting after um, leaving uh, public service. I think that was for the second time. So uh, that's how I count my career. I've been in and out of the public service three times and um, strategy, governance, capability were things that I've been doing quite recently. So the move to ASPE was, was probably one of the more natural steps that I've taken along the way. There have been some interesting ones. I think for me, you, you know, if you have a willingness to be challenged, if you have a willingness to... Um, grab what is uh, nearby, then all sorts of opportunities will come your way and people will notice you as somebody who can just, you know, take an idea and do something with it. 
Thanks, Jill. Um, very interesting experience starting as a botanist. I would love to hear more about that. Um, Catherine, I'd like to turn to you now. Um, you have a range of experience in national security and across the public sector as well, including in border security, defence and foreign policy. Can you tell us a little bit about your career path? Um, how did you end up at the Office of National Intelligence and you know, what drew you to, to a career in national security? Yeah, sure. Thanks, uh, Olivia. Um, so I probably have the slightly opposite story to Jill in that uh, I kind of always liked the national security stuff, you know, as a kid, I always read spy books, you know, I liked all the kind of cops and robbers type stuff. So when I was looking at what I wanted to do when I, you know, grew up, it was always, I looked at the military, I looked at the police services, um, and I looked at the intelligence agencies. Uh, and that was sort of always where I was just naturally gravitated to. Um, so my career predominantly has been in um, intelligence agencies. I've spent some time uh, in a border agency. I've spent some time at Defence. Um, I've worked up at Parliament House as a national security advisor. I've done private sector consulting on national security issues. Oh, I lost an ear. Um, uh, so I've always in my career it's always been about national security because that's what motivates me i think it's really fun it's exciting the work we do we get to do really cool stuff uh we get to know stuff before it hits the papers if it ever hits the papers you know all of that stuff i really i really enjoy um so i've worked across um where there are 10 um intelligence agencies now in our community i've essentially worked in half of them um, in my career. Uh, so for me, my current role at the Office of National Intelligence, where I essentially am an intelligence mission manager across um, our community and I work with all of the agencies on making sure that the community as a whole is geared up in support of government's objectives. Um, it's for me at the moment in my career where I am, it's the perfect role for me. I've kind of, I understand the business from a defense, a border, a criminal intelligence, an espionage perspective, um, and I can kind of bring all of that together um, in O and I. So I'm loving what I do. It's fascinating. I encourage all people of all backgrounds to join the intelligence community. It's, um, it's fascinating. It takes you places you'd never expect. Thanks so much, Catherine. Um, yes, wow, <laughs> such an incredible background. I think, yeah, I was quite similar to you. I've always kind of international relations has been my passion as well. So um, Kelsey, I would love to turn to you. Um, you have a really interesting background. So you, you worked as a journalist and then you moved across to Lowy where you produced their rules-based audio podcast. Um, and now you're here with us at ASPE as, uh, with the International Cyber Policy Centre. Can you tell us about a little bit about your background? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Olivia. Um, yeah, look, my my career looks there's nothing strategic about it. It's been a bunch of oh, that looks interesting over there. I'm going to go do that. Um, I would like to say I've been more strategic, um, but it's not true. So, yeah, I actually my undergraduate was law and literature, and I um, was it sort of started out as a writer really and my first actual job was a features writer at Rolling Stone it's a little bit removed from where I am now um sort of moved into journalism from there um worked for a long time for the Sydney Morning Herald and once I was there I was just really interested in the pointy end of the newsroom when news was happening um and I moved over there and once I was there I guess I I think I started studying at the same time international relations focused on China and um just became more and more interested in how China was was impacting real life in Australia. So I started doing more reporting around China and issues like that, which is sort of how I, in a roundabout way, um, ended up via via working at Lowy, doing some some research and stuff there um, here at ASPE. Um, and I've been here about six months, and it's so much fun. It's a great place. There's a lot of opportunity for acting on um, interesting ideas, so many smart people here to talk to and learn from. So it's really great. Thanks, Kelsey. Do you miss journalism at all? No, because I did it for so long and, you know, sort of it got faster and faster towards the end and you would often have to get across the story and write it up all within like half a day and it got very, um, I mean, you, you can do it, but it's, it's nice to be able to, spend more time get more in depth into topics like we can here the pace is still important in a think tank i think you can't just sit around forever and 
wait for two years to publish something, but um, but it's quite different to daily journalism, and I I feel like I'd had enough of that. Truly. <laughs> Thank you. Now, Claire, our our last, our fourth and final panelist. I'd love to introduce you now. Um, so you have over 20 years experience in the Australian Army, including postings in Afghanistan, Indonesia, South Korea, and Papua New Guinea. On top of this, you have been the Chief of Army Scholar and a Fulbright Scholar at Georgetown University. Um, and you are the founder and editor of Grounded Curiosity. And you're also currently studying economics. Um, can you tell us a little bit about, about your career path? And, and your, I guess it would be really interesting to hear about your approach to choosing the right steps for yourself throughout your career. Thanks, Olivia, and, and I've really enjoyed everybody's answers so far. Um, I guess from the moment I entered the Australian Defence Force and I joined as a 17-year-old, I kind of myth-busted about having this list of jobs and then following on a predetermined career path. Uh, my childhood, I'd seen images of the Australian Army in Rwanda and Somalia, in East Timor, and I think the thing that then ultimately made me join is I saw some doctors in Papua New Guinea after the 1998 uh, tsunami had just devastated um, a northern coastal village in Papua New Guinea. And at that moment, I kind of turned to whoever was listening and said, I want to be an army doctor and I'm not an army doctor. So you can see that I have not succeeded on the original career path that I wanted to do. Um, I had advice from an adult who I trusted at the time that to join the army I needed to go to the Australian Defence Force. So that's what I did in the expectation that I was eventually going to become an army doctor, which is why um, having a list of jobs to do has not really worked out for me so well. Um, but kind of, I joined the Australian Army and I realise now I really didn't know what that meant. Um, it, it meant that I'd signed up to serve, but it didn't mean that I got to choose what that service looked like. But what I did have instead of a career path is I think from the moment that I'd seen the Australian Army in those images in Rwanda and Somalia and East Timor was that I knew that I wanted to do good in dangerous places. And that kind of gave me a broad direction of travel that the Australian Army has always enabled me to do um, in service of the nation. And so having this broad direction of travel, always knowing why I was serving, um, has led to these opportunities in the Australian Army that I, I don't think I could have ever sat down and written the job list for. So my broad direction of travel has always worked out for me because I haven't always gotten the jobs that I've actually wanted. Um, but, but no matter the job that I've had, um, even after Dumtroon graduating from there, I didn't get the units that I was hoping for. I kind of always tried to do the job well that I was in instead of looking too far forward because I was always doing something that ultimately I loved to do. And that worked out pretty well for me because doing the job that I was in and doing it well actually then meant that I was chosen for opportunities um, that I never expected to do that actually came with that job that hadn't been defined at the start of it. So I got to work in a remote Indigenous community um, as part of my first job in a unit that I, I hadn't thought that I wanted to go to. Um, because I did well in that job, I was selected to move to Darwin to go um, to Afghanistan with the first push of conventional forces over there. I loved that job. I loved working in those communities, again, doing good in dangerous places. I did well in that job, which then led to the next job, which then eventually as a civil engineer led me to do um, a Master's of International Relations because I was fascinated by human security, which eventually led to a Fulbright scholarship and it kind of went on from there. So I don't have any recommendations for steps of a career path because it hasn't worked out for me, but always knowing why I'm serving um, and then trying to be the best I can be for the job um, that I'm currently doing rather than looking too far forward has kind of led me to these awesome opportunities. Thanks so much, Glenn. I think, yeah, that's definitely something that I and probably a lot of our audience can, can definitely relate to. Um, just quickly, what do you have any highlights that you can share? Oh, so many. And my highlights are probably the people that I've really worked with and uh, probably topical. So I'll, I'll share this as a highlight. I um, when I was posted to the 3rd Combat Engineer Regiment as an officer commanding, I got to spend much of that time working with the Papua New Guinea 
uh, defence force and just remarkable people. Um, joining the military can really change people's lives. That happens to Australians. Um, it certainly happens if you join the Papua New Guinea Defence Force. It not only changes those uh, the lives of those men and women as they sign up to serve their nation, it also changes and puts on a different path their families, really kind of raises people up um, joining um, the Defence Force and working with them was just extraordinary. I got to work with the 2nd Royal Pacific Island Regiment um, in Port Moresby, which is an infantry battalion. Uh, we were doing engineer work, but the commanding officer there asked me to command one of his infantry companies of excellence um, to prepare them in the lead up for APEC. And uh, that was just one of those moments where somebody from another military force asked you to command his men and women was really a bit of a career highlight. And then seeing those same, some of those same men and women come down at the beginning of the year to help Australia out in the bushfires was kind of one of those moments that you're, you're quite proud of. So I share that one as a career highlight. Thanks so much, Claire. Uh, and thank you to each of you for joining us tonight. It's, it's so interesting to hear about you. You clearly all got such different backgrounds and different pathways to getting where you are now. Um, I'd like to ask you each one more question before I go to questions from the audience. So please submit your questions on the side there. Um, Opportunities in the national security and defence space are definitely competitive, and I think COVID is only going to make that more so. Um, Jill, I'd like to ask you a little bit about recruitment. You know, we always we're always trying to put our best foot forward, obviously, and sometimes that might mean that we're kind of shaping ourselves maybe to fit the job description rather than kind of pitching at our strengths. Um, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on, you know, in your recruitment experience. What other kind of key attributes that you're looking for? And is it always, you know, what's asked for in the job description? Or, um, yeah, I'd love to hear insights on that. Yeah, thanks. And it is an interesting one that um, sometimes we do try to, I guess, shape ourselves into um, a particular space and it's possibly not the right kind of space for us. Um, I've done a lot of recruitment even before I held uh, a couple of chief operating officer roles. Um, and uh, even, you know, as way back as uh, in the Department of Environment. Um, and I think that, you know, the thing we have to sort of get our heads around is that everybody is capable who is applying for these jobs. Everybody has experience um, and, you know, everybody has the potential to do the job really well. Um, so when you approach it um, from perhaps the application um, perspective, You've really got to stand out and, and stand out in a good way as opposed to uh, a negative way, and I'll, I'll come back to, uh, to that. But I, I think people are looking, no matter where they are, no matter what level they're at, no matter what role they're in, um, they're looking at three things. So, so one is about, um, you know, I want to work with uh, nice people, good people, capable people, collegiate people. Um, One's about, I want to do something interesting. I want to have an impact. Um, I, I like that idea of, you know, doing good in dangerous places. That that really resonated for, with, for me as well. Um, and I want something for the future. You know, I want to do some work that's going to develop me for the next thing, whatever that might be, whether or not we have a plan uh, doesn't really matter. So if you think about it from that perspective, think about your application, think your think about the approach to an interview in that context because that's what the panel is looking for too. They're looking for good people to work with. They're looking for people who are interested in the role. And this might sound really, really funny, but I, I can't, you know, I've lost count of the number of times that uh, someone's applied for a role and, it, and has appeared to be completely disinterested <laughs> in the role. Um, you, you know, they've managed to get to the interview and you're still not convinced that uh, they actually want this job. I think as part of that, people struggle to answer the question uh, why I want to do the role and also what value would I personally add to this role? Um, and, you know, I have to be really authentic about the whole thing. Uh, some people overstate and that's really obvious and some people hold back, and that's actually obvious too. So, you know, you need some people around you that you trust that you can run things past. Um, and sometimes 
you know, because you've talked about your work, because you've talked about the experiences that you've had, perhaps, you know, you've done that in a social setting. Sometimes those people actually know you much better than you think and they can suggest you inserting things into your application that you've done if you're a little bit hesitant um, about putting yourself forward. Um, those who over-promote, uh, you know, they, they, they don't get very far. If they do get, you know, into a particular role, uh, they soon get found out for not having a lot of substance. So you do have to have some substance and you have to be authentic about your approach to all of this because, you know, the, the panel is looking for authentic people. They're looking for people that they want to be working with as well. Um, and they want similar things that, that you want. Thanks, Jill. And those are definitely some, some notes that I'll, I'll take to my next interview as well. <laughs> um, Claire, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about leadership. I think um, there's obviously plenty of different leadership styles and uh, for some of us, leadership definitely doesn't come naturally and it's something that we learn and develop. Um, so I'd like to hear your, your thoughts on, on what makes a good leader. Um, yeah, what, what are some of the characteristics and skills that you think make a, an effective leader? Um, to begin with, I'd probably just highlight Aspie's previous um, session of this where Major General Cheryl Pierce spoke about authentic leadership. I won't repeat that. Um, she does a brilliant job of it explaining, explaining authentic leadership and I'd recommend that you watch that. Um, I would add that when I kind of was being taught leadership and leadership something hard to teach because you kind of have to get stuck in, make mistakes and then kind of grow and learn um, from that as a leader. But when they were kind of teaching me leadership, they'd always ask, what kind of leader do you want to be? Or what kind of leader are you going to be? And then would usually follow with examples in history of a charismatic leader who'd done brave and bold things. And I've always reflected on that question, what kind of leader do you think that you are or that you want to be? And over the years, I've just reframed that question um, to be what kind of leader does your team need you to be? Does your team need you to be for the context that you face, for the mission that you have or the task that you have at, at hand? Because leadership is about people. And so framing the right questions for you to reflect on what kind of leader that you are, I found that to be a much better question question. Um, teaming is something that I think we always grapple with and always have. But to me, it's really important because your team is not only your subordinates, it's the people that sit to the left and right of you, your support network, your peers, it's your command team, it's your boss is part of the team. So you've got these sub teams within wider teams. In the Australian Defence Force, we work a lot with whole of government agencies. Um, the future challenge of how do we human machine team and what does leadership look like but that is one of those really cool kind of concepts to get involved in of if our teams are changing how do we do it uh, when we work overseas as in the Australian Army as part of the Australian Defence Force we're usually teaming with different partners and so what kind of leader do you need to be for the team that you have at hand noting that your teams are multi-layered is one of the leadership lessons that I've probably learnt the hard way over the years but I find a really rather than having a set of principles of his something to cover everything I find that a really handy question to ask in any leadership role that I face. And just to follow on from that, we've had a question come in from Marley. How do you strike a balance between, sorry to put you on the spot, <laughs> um, between being a boss or between being a leader versus being a friend? Um, how do you distinguish this and, and what are some actionable, thing, actionable things to make this distinction in everyday actions? Yeah, so, and I think this is probably where the authentic leadership comes into it. You People have different personalities and different characters. And in a military context, there is a difference between command and the authority that you get with command and then leadership. And so in a leadership role, to be an authentic leader who displays empathy, um, is sometimes can be mistaken for being friends, but I think that they are different things. And again, sometimes I know as a junior leader, like you, you learn the hard way to find and strike that balance. And again, it's different for different teams at different times. When I've done humanitarian and disaster relief, 
we've been in some really sad situations where you have human devastation and sometimes you're the first teams in, particularly um, in structural assessment teams that I've been in and disaster relief, sometimes you're the first team into these places and you have to deal with that. And again, the people standing on your flanks as part of that team, no matter if you're the boss and they're your subordinates, there is going to be a quality called mateship um, in there with a great deal of empathy to get through there. But that may be different in different contexts. Um, if we were to go to war tomorrow as a commander, you may need to give orders um, that that may put your men and women lives in danger and, and they need to trust you to be able to make those good calls. So the balance is, I know that I've learned it the hard way and I probably will continue to make mistakes in it. But instead of friendship, I'd use the word mateship. Um, and instead of friendship, I'd also look at that authenticity and empathy rather than kind of putting it in that term of friendship of, of something that you do. Thanks so much, Claire. And, and Catherine, I'd like to get to, to kind of pull you into this discussion as well and cultural leadership. Um, you're at ONI, you're the Gender and Sexual Identity Champion. Um, can you tell us a little bit about, about this role and um, what it encompasses and, and I guess any, any achievements you're most proud of? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, so picking up on um, some of the points Claire's made about leadership, I mean, within the intelligence communities, um, things around diversity of people um, is has been a challenge and something that the community has been looking at for the last few years. It's not just about gender, it's not just about queer representation or culturally and linguistically diverse. It's about people who think differently, uh, who approach, who have just different life experiences and that diversity is critical for any organisation and any community to get the best outcomes. Um, so I've, did, I've, I've been in this role at ONI for a couple of years. I've done it in a few other intelligence agencies. It goes towards leadership. It goes towards making a statement, an organisation making a statement that diversity is important to it, um, that it is acknowledging that work is required to improve uh, the current stats. Um, and for me, it's it's a, it's a way of um, playing a different sort of leadership role in, in my organisations or in, in the community, and it's something that I you know, genuinely enjoy doing. Um, and so that goes towards sort of my authenticity. Um, uh, in terms of things I'm most proud of, um, look, it's really hard because this kind of stuff is incremental. Um, we set targets. Uh, we do an okay job at meeting that. Um, it, it informs our recruitment drives. It's, it's sort of small incremental changes where uh, really the best outcome is where you see behavioural change in those around you and you realise that actually the work you've been doing the last couple of years is paying dividends um, uh, and it's little things like having uh, male employees who come to me and say I'm about to become a dad and I really want to have a flexible work environment do you think it'll be okay if I take paternity leave you know that kind of stuff and those kind of changes are critical and I think as we get generational change those kinds of things will happen um, and it also goes to just this, the idea of visibility. You know, what kind of visible leaders do we have in the intelligence community? We, we should be having people that look and sound different, uh, that think different, um, and part of my role is making sure that I am visible and, um, and in, more importantly, accessible to people within the community so that if they want to come and talk about their career, if they want to talk about diversity-related issues, you know, are we, a, you know, family-friendly? Are we accepting of people with different backgrounds? Um, how, what role does all of that play? Um, I'm, a, I'm a touch point for people to be able to do that. So it picks up on some of the themes that, uh, that Claire touched on. It picks up on some of the comments Jill made about being authentic and genuine and passionate about what you do. Um, but it is all incremental change and it'll take more time and more effort and more work, but more focus, and that's okay. Sounds like really great work, but I think, yeah, these incremental changes will eventually eventuate into one very big change, so yeah. it all counts. It does. <laughs> and, and, you know, uh, we have the first female head of an intelligence agency now, should have probably happened earlier, but that's okay. We're there now, and I look at my peers, at the sort of deputy and sort of one below level, and there are a lot of women. Um, there are a lot of uh, 
you know, queer identifying people. There are a lot of very different people coming through the organisations. And so I know that in five years, that leadership cohort will be making its way through. And, and as a result, the culture within the intelligence communities will change for the better. Promising. Sounds promising. Um, I'd like to move uh, away from leadership and talk about um, career pivots. And Kelsey, I thought I'd come to you for this one. Um, you know, you switch from journalism into the think tank space. Um, I guess the skill sets will be somewhat similar, but at the same time, maybe quite different. Um, how did you find that shift and, and what would be your kind of advice for people listening or watching that, that would be interested in something similar? Um, that's a good question. God, it's so interesting and frankly terrifying to hear about the amazing things my co-panelists have done with their, their careers. Um, but look, I think part of I mean, the authenticity thing really rings true with me. I, um, I think that I was always interested in this space but couldn't see a way into it for me because it always seemed very blokey. It always seemed very um, far away and full of beard striking men who pronounced the truth from on high and it was all very terrifying. So it took me a long while to sort of inch my way towards um, feeling like I could maybe contribute something in this space. Um, one of the things I think that helped is, I mean, being in journalism, you talk to people from all walks of life, but you can also sort of hone in on stuff you're interested in, develop some sort of expertise in in areas just purely kind of self-nominating really if you you know well that it's, it's changing now but you know in a big newsroom that used to be what you could do you could sort of work towards stuff you're interested in develop your expertise and your networks in that and that really helped me pivot into this space um like i said it wasn't sort of planned out in advance but that's how it happened um and and something about particularly working at SPICPC, the International Cyber Policy Centre. I mean, it's a very creative space. They take a very creative approach to the research we do. Um, and I think if you are a, a, a sort of young person interested in getting into this space, there are a lot, probably a lot more ways to, you know, make your work known than there ever were before. I'm thinking of my colleague, Nathan Rusa, who was hired when he was still at university, after a sort of series of um, data stuff he worked out and put on Twitter, um, that led to that story that you probably all remember. I think it was in the New York Times a few years ago with the um, Fitbits. You know, they found traced military base sites from that. That was Nathan. He was at uni. I mean, so there are ways that you can sort of get your if you're interested in this space, you start writing. You know, you can start writing. You put stuff online. Um, you can you can sort of especially if you're a writer or you're doing original data work, that's that's a path you can take. Um, that just wasn't really available before. Um, and uh, yeah, in terms, of, in terms of pivoting, certainly from journalism to the think tank space, there's huge amount of overlap in the skills you need. Um, you know, uh, research writing skills, knowing where to ask questions, knowing, I guess, you know, broad broad sense of how things work and where you where the person might be who knows the thing you need to know, things like that. Um, being able to work quickly, work in a team in a sort of collegiate environment is all really important in both spaces. But as I as I kind of said before, the, the appealing thing about um, the think tank research space is having a bit more time to really get your teeth into topics rather than kind of flying past them at speed and uh, having to kind of move on quickly. Does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, thanks, Kelsey. Um, just before I get to the Q&A, I'd like to ask you one more question, Jill, and actually anyone in the panel who, you know, who'd like to jump in on this one. Um, I wanted to ask you about extracurricular activities and volunteering, and um, I feel like, you know, they, they can be an opportunity to build skills, also for networking. Um, you know, they can be seen as an opportunity to kind of help pro career progression. Um, Jill, you're UN Women Empowerment Champion um, and you've held previous kind of volunteer roles uh, similar. Um, I'd like to get your thoughts on on kind of how you pick your volunteer uh, opportunities yeah. um, and what motivates you in doing these things. Yeah. Uh, look, I think for me it's about having an impact. Um, my, my career and most of everything that I do is um, about making the world a better place uh, in, you know, even in a small way as, as you know, sort of uh, 
there's something quite satisfying uh, when you can demonstrate that even tiny steps are going to have a, um, a positive impact somewhere on someone. So that's the real, real thing that drives me. Um, in terms of things I do outside of work, uh, what I would say to people is, you know, you have to be interested in it. You have to be passionate about it. Um, it you, you can't, you know, often people say, well, it's good for my career if I go and do whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, it, if it's not an interest, it won't be good for your career um, because it will, you know, be really obvious uh, that uh, you, you're probably doing it for the wrong reason, that you're probably doing it in a half-hearted way, um, or you're probably not doing it at all. And I think that's probably one of the really big things I would say to people is that you, you have to commit uh, whatever it is. Um, you have to turn up when, you, when you're expected, when you say you're going to turn up. You have to do what you say you're going to do. Um, and getting back to the, the, the recruitment, um, I see a lot of CVs and we've just been through a round of uh, intern uh, recruitment for the professional development team. And uh, we had a lot of applications and, and a lot of people have a long list of things that they're volunteering for. Um, I look at those lists and I partly don't believe it because nobody's got that much time uh, to commit outside of studies, outside of work, outside of family. Um, and so it actually distracts from what they're saying. So really, you know, one or two things is good uh, but it needs to be one or two things that you're interested in. Um, and from a reputational perspective, you need to commit and deliver something. If you don't follow through, it definitely will have a, an impact on your career. Um, you know, professional network is really important. And, you know, uh, I've, I've been active in, active in the uh, Institute of Public Administration Australia for a long time particularly around the Innovation Awards. Um, uh, I'm currently just joined the board of the, this is a bit of a mouthful, Australian uh, Institute of Professional Intelligence Officers. So, you know, those sorts of things uh, for me are things that I'm interested in and things that um, I can contribute to, but also I get some personal value out of being part of. So, you know, that, that would be my guidance. Um, a couple of things, not a whole lot of things, and uh, make sure that you 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 know you're interested enough to turn up. You're interested enough to uh, make a contribution because that's really what it's about. Thanks, Jill. Now I'd like to get to some of our questions from our audience. Um, we have one question from Lauren. She's asking about advice on. Well, do you have any advice on getting the balance right when it comes to moving into different areas to gain experience? Um, and to broaden your knowledge and skills versus staying in one area long enough to kind of, I guess, become a subject matter expert and hone particular skills. Um, I guess anyone, anyone kind of have ideas on that balance who would like to jump in here? I'll go have a crack. I'll go first. Um, so I a few of us have said this, but you've got to be interested in it. So it's one thing to say, oh, well, I'll go after that because it'll broaden me out. But again, if you're not that interested in it, it won't be great. Um, I did some consulting work for um, a few years and uh, I was the national security consultant. But in the consulting world, if there isn't work, you go and do something else. I ended up doing health, yeah. health consulting, which taught me that I could apply my thinking and my approach to a social policy environment, but it also reconfirmed for me that that was not <laughs> the environment I get the most joy out of. Um, so uh, you got to sort of know what your strengths and weaknesses are, um, where your interests lie. Diversity is good. Some people thrive on it. Some people like change. I generally change every job pretty much every three years because I get bored. I know that about myself and that's okay. Uh, I know uh, lots of other people, excellent people, who uh, that changing jobs every three years would drive them bonkers um, and they wouldn't thrive in that environment. So what's your personal um, strengths? Where do you naturally sit? Um, and, and what are you interested in? Um, Sometimes the answer is, well, I want to try something different because I don't know. And that's absolutely a legitimate reason to do that as well. Um, 
So it's always about kind of to making an informed decision as much as you can, but but just follow your passions and follow your interests because then you will do well. Yes, I'm happy to jump in. I, I think that's absolutely right. Um, you know, you do need to do uh, those things that align with your strengths. Um, it's an interesting thing about your strengths because uh, sometimes the things that you enjoy most um, are you know, perhaps a little bit peripheral to the strengths that others see. So they're looking for, looking to you for those sorts of strengths versus the ones that you really want to pursue. And that can be a bit of a, a balancing act for you. Um, in the public sector for a long time, we've, we've talked about um, absolutes of uh, uh, technical specialists and generalists. I don't think that was ever a thing. I, I think you have to have some content and some substance in something, um, even if you're the generalist that people talk about. Um, I think the whole sort of aspect around being, um, you know, really honing your um, leadership skills and, you know, in a, in a sort of, uh, perhaps more public service or a private sector context, leadership takes all sorts of different forms and, um, you know, you do find yourself in environments. And if I go back to the volunteering and the extracurricular um, uh, interests, you find yourself in, in environments where people don't have to recognise you as a leader. They're there because they're passionate and they're motivated about a particular area your challenge is to harness that your challenge is to do something you'd unified with that um and and you know that's one thing that does come out of uh volunteering that you, you develop a set of leadership capability that is quite different i think to what you might develop if you're in a particular role or a particular position at a particular level um so you know your, your strengths are important, know what they are, and also understand the difference between uh, what you want to pursue and what others value you for, because that can sometimes be a bit of a challenge and a bit of a, uh, a, a, a difficult to thing to navigate if you keep getting the same sorts of opportunities in your organisation because that's what the organisation needs from you. Um, but perhaps that's not making your heart sing anymore, then, you know, you might need to have a think about how you're going to navigate through that. Thanks, Jill. That's, yeah, that's really insightful. Um, we have a question as well from Marley. Um, so they're asking about networking and how do, you, how do you grow and shape your network? How do you stay engaged with the network without feeling like uh, too much of a burden as though you're asking too much of the people within your network? And they also ask about how you how to approach mentors. Um, I think networking, especially maybe for um, us millennials, is something that is um, very can be very intimidating, um, especially I guess if you're kind of early career or just a, you know a university graduate. Um, you know, you can't, it's kind of like a difficult thing to build. So, who would like to answer that? I'm happy to go first. Uh, you know, I think networking is intimidating for everybody. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I have a, um, a, a group of um, SES Band 1 level um, uh, public servants that I get together every now and then. And I, it started because um, I was mentoring them individually. And then one day I realised that I had, you know, so many opportunities to share their experiences and to support each other that, I got them together and, and created them as a network group. And uh, it's largely self-managing, which is a great thing now. Um, but I did that because they were all busy, uh, jobs and families and, um, uh, you know, school activities and all of those sorts of things. And they, um, I, I won't say it was an excuse, but um, I, I think... They possibly could have overcome some of that, uh, but they didn't work on their, their network. They didn't connect with people who were outside of their immediate task and their immediate job. 
Um, and you really do need that network because uh, when it's time to think about other things, you know, it provides opportunity for movement. Um, it provides opportunity to um, uh, explore different places because people know who you are and will open some doors for you and so on. Um, about the mentoring, that's a really interesting one. I'm yet to find uh, a prospective mentor who wasn't incredibly flattered by being asked to be a mentor. Um, so don't don't worry that they will say no because I'm almost convinced no one would say no. They'd be too flattered to to uh, to say no. Does anyone else have any thoughts on this, Kelsey? Yeah, yeah look, I, I I would just say that I mean. I totally agree with Jill's very sage advice. Like it's incredibly helpful. But I've always been absolutely hopeless at networking. It just if it's supposed to be, if it, it feels sort of instrumental, it just leaves me cold. I can't do it. And I think it works better if you just if you connect on a personal level with people and you stay in touch with them. You know, just generally some sort of authentic connection with someone is gonna probably have a lot more utility to you as well as just you'll enjoy them as a human um, in the long run because I mean, so maybe some people are really good at that, but but I'm not. But I have got jobs through people I know because you just sort of, I guess, more authentic connections. If you can if you can focus on those, maybe quality over quantity would be my comment there. Does anyone else have anything to add, Claire? Just very quickly, so I, hopefully I've put the link up. There is an excellent series by Lindsay Freeman and Shazma Lee um, on how to get started with mentoring because it can be quite awkward and they've got some great tips in there and they've got another article coming out in about two weeks' time on networking and um, I get to see the articles in advance and I'm already stealing all of their advice to use. I was really late in um, figuring out that networking and having mentors was really important. I've tried to do it alone that is and then I've used mentors and a greater network and it I've been a better person for it the ability to bounce ideas particularly when you're in a leadership role which sometimes can be lonely to bounce ideas off of somebody else who is not tied in emotionally to what's going on has just been invaluable um, and the other just bit that I'd add on mentors and networking is that as you change and do different roles, it's okay to change your network. Um, as you grow as a person, it's okay to change your mentors too. Um, and, and you can sometimes feel a tug of loyalty, particularly to networks and getting that balance right of giving back to the network, but also sometimes it's okay to change. And in the Defence Force, I've really changed my networks to be more people outside of the Defence Force because they give me greater perspective than just the echo chamber that I sometimes get through bouncing ideas from people who have exactly the same experience as me. Thanks so much, Claire. Um, we have a question here from Victoria. She's asking about adv what advice would you give someone currently embarking on a second career? She's studying a master's in cybersecurity analysis. Um, how do you pos position your experience and skills from a different background to apply for roles in government or agencies? Um, Catherine or Jill, can I go to you for this one? Uh, sure. I mean, um, look, government agencies are looking for people with skills of all sorts. So like anything, it's about trying to make the link between uh, what you've learned and what skills and attributes you've learned from your previous uh, career and how you can apply it. Um, I would also say that uh, studying a master's in cybersecurity, there will be uh, a wealth of opportunities <laughs> uh, in government jobs from intelligence security right through to um, uh, policy advice as well. So there, there will be many things uh, for someone studying that to pursue if she, if you so choose to, Victoria. Um, but really, it's just it's it's how you frame it. Um, you know, what expertise, what skills did you learn from your previous career and how can you apply those behaviours and that um, approach into the new career that you're seeking to pursue? Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And I think, um, again, that's one of those things that uh, we, we, it takes us a bit of time to learn. Uh, we consider the roles that we've done in the context of the tasks that we've performed rather than the skills and the capabilities that we've built along the way. 
and that translation into a different role um, sometimes is quite hard for us because we haven't looked at the previous role or the current role and what that means in terms of what capability do we really have um, and, and what's my value add and what's the impact that I have. And then you also need to understand a little bit more about what that new role is and correlate and, and connect the two. Um, and, you know, if, if you can do that, then that, that will be, you know, it becomes a very powerful um, story that you can tell uh, based on quite different experiences and quite different sectors that you might have worked in. Thanks, Jill. Uh, we also have a, question, a couple of questions uh, about kind of graduates, university graduates. Um, kind of what are some practical upskilling opportunities for applicants looking to stand out from the crowd? Um, so what advice do you have for graduates dealing with imposter syndrome? Does anyone want to, to jump in with that one? Um, I, I would just like to say this doesn't directly answer the question, but I probably have the opposite from imposter syndrome in that joining, joining the military and having roles closed off to women, you often wanted to knock on those doors and kind of say, we're ready, um, we can do that job. So it's interesting that I hear a lot about imposter syndrome and kind of in my early career kind of felt the exact opposite and thankfully had some wonderful bosses who got me into rooms that um, and into roles that uh, we weren't actually meant to be doing at that point in time because the policy was still women not in those combat roles. So I always find the imposter syndrome something opposite to me, so I'm not sure if that applies to somebody else. But um, I do sit on a lot of boards for scholarships and different things, and the thing that always um, stands out as a point of difference is somebody's passion. Um, you can hear it in their voice. You can hear it um, about how motivated they are for a particular job. So um, that's not something that you can upskill necessarily for, but if you're passionate about wanting to do that role and you know why you want to do it, I tell you what, it stands out on those boards each and every time. And I guess following on from that, there's, there's another question about, you know, any recommendations or steps for first career steps for university students who are interested in working in intelligence in the security sector. Um, can I throw that one to you, Catherine? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, research and kind of get out and listen. So, you know, most of the intelligence agencies will participate in careers fairs, if we're still holding them uh, virtually or face-to-face. -face. Um, go and listen to, pe to people, um, look at websites, have a think about what aspect you're interested within the intelligence community. Because the problem, of course, is there's so much choice you know you might be interested in being you know a field intelligence officer you might be a linguist who you want to use your language you might have a great analytical brain and you want to go deep on a topic you might be a cyber sort of security expert you might be a data analyst you know there, you might be a psychologist i think i saw that on one of the questions there is a job for every one of those uh, people in the intelligence community. So it's really about understanding where where's your interests and therefore where do you think you're going to get the best fit. But, I mean, I speak at careers fairs. Uh, lots of uh, intelligence agencies have outreach programs to schools now. Um, lots of agencies, including O&I, offer part-time work uh, for universities, it's people in the last couple of years of their university degree, part-time work, you go through your um, security clearance process, that gives you a, a step ahead as well. So there are lots of avenues available to find out more. Um, and of course, there's, this, there's the very traditional recruitment streams. Um, you know, there's graduate recruitment, there's specialist recruitment. Um, uh, and if you have a network uh, and you know people in the community, they'll point you into, into other more targeted roles as well. So, so there are a myriad of options to understand where you might best thrive. Thanks so much, Catherine. Um, Jill, I would love to throw this question to you. What are the main distinctions between working in the government and corporate sector in the security field? Um, and do you have any comments on which you prefer and why? Uh, uh, answer to the last Question is no. <laughs> no, 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 no preference. Um, they're they're just different, um, and I think, um, 
you know, sometimes it's the same place and you think it would be quite similar, but it, it isn't. Um, I, I think, you know, I'm very passionate about public sector and um, con contributing to uh, Australian society. And, you know, that's the same for me, whether I'm a public servant or whether I'm working as a consultant in a government department or working in a think tank or working in anywhere else. So so I think, you know, it's really about how you approach it and what's important to you. Um, there, there are some really great things about the private sector and some not so great things. There are some really great things about the public sector and some not so great things. So um, one isn't better than the other. They're just different. Uh, you need some flexibility um, and you need a little bit of uh, awareness to understand how different they are so that you can be successful in either sector. Does anyone else want to add anything there? No? Um, we have someone asking as well, how do you change people's perception of your skills? And I guess that follows on from what we were discussing earlier in terms of your organisation might have you on a different path than you have, on yourself, have for yourself. Um, uh, Melissa is saying she's seen as a numbers person and her soft skills are, are discarded. So how do you get people to see beyond kind of the these skills and recognise other transferable skills? Does anyone have any insights on that? Um, I would say that um, kind of a parallel, although not maybe a direct one, is that it's been hard as a woman to be seen uh, even though I'm in it, combat arms, as a woman who has been in combat and a bunch of other stuff, it's really hard to convince the system that 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 is who I am. And so, but again, this probably comes back to mentors. Sometimes your best advocate to tell other people um, your skills is not necessarily you because that's a hard balance to strike. It's about finding mentors advocates um, and that network in which you can share your stories and then um, finding those people who believe in you. They're often people who've worked for you in order to do advocate on your behalf because it is very hard. I've found it very hard to do um, when it's you trying to sell your own story. So it's back to mentoring and networks for me. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with that. And I, I think um, for me, I've had a lot of uh, secondments to d different places that has enabled me to demonstrate particular expertise or particular capabilities that wouldn't otherwise be seen. And, you know, i go back to uh, the Department of the Environment. I went on secondment uh, to manage immigration detention <laughs> from the Department of Environment. And, you know, I was working on climate change and, you know, uh, waste policy and all, all sorts of things that, you know, when I think about it, quite funny for me now. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's that's probably my first step into that um, more uh, border protection, security and national security space. Um, having done that, that really highlighted um, for others, not uh, just in terms of where I was working in immigration, but also in my own home department in environment, potential and opportunities started to, to flow um, from that as well. So, yeah, try something new in a safe way and, uh, you know, you, you surprise a lot of people, I think. Thanks, Jill. And we, we are about to wrap up, but I would like to ask one last question of our panellists. Um, I guess one thing we always kind of struggle with is how do you know when is the right time to leave a role? Um, yeah, how, how long should you, how long should, you know, should, how long should you establish yourself before moving on? Is there a set time that kind of our early to mid-career um, audience should be kind of spending it at in, in one kind of line of work before they move on? Or, yeah, what are your thoughts on this? I think you just need to stay around long enough to prove to people you're serious and committed <laughs> and you're going to show up every day and do your job. I mean, you don't, it doesn't look great to sort of chop and change every six months, I would say. Um, 
having said that, I'm a person who left jobs with nothing to go to at times in my life when I thought I'd had enough of something and just wanted to jump without a parachute. And fortunately, it worked out for me. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's that's after showing you know a lot of commitment and and long term sort of um, you know you can't you can't chop and change. I think is probably helpful. Um, I, I'd suggest that um, it, you, when you are running out of ideas and running out of enthusiasm for just the hard grinds that any job entails, that probably signals that you're running about a puff a little bit and you might need a new, a new role for a new sort of refresh and a new challenge. Um, but uh, some people have views on this, but ultimately if you're going to work in government, you've you got you to be able to deliver um and and that is valued uh within organizations the ability to actually um you know shape something deliver it see it through that doesn't mean you have to be there for yeah. years and years on end but if you are moving too quickly and that you don't really be out you can't really sort of turn around and say actually you know i did that thing over there and you know i'm quite proud of it um then that probably means you haven't quite stayed long enough but everyone's going to be um, different, so you've got to find the right balance uh, for you. So enthusiasm for the role, being able to deliver something uh, and show show kind of value and impact. Thanks, Catherine. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, yeah, Jill, did you want to quickly? Oh, I was just going to say, I, I don't think there's an easy answer to this one. Um, it's, not, it's not a time-based thing. Um, I, I always come back to uh, the substance, and I think that, that um, connects with what Catherine was saying about de delivery. You have to have substance, sufficient substance in a particular role before you start to think about moving on to the next thing. Thanks, Jill. And thank you to each of you for joining us tonight. Um, that is the end of our panel. Um, we look forward to the next one. Yeah, I just want to thank each of you for joining us and for sharing your insights. I, I could listen to them for a few more hours, I think. Um, so thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much.